Um, next up, we have Joshua Morley. I met Joshua um, about three or four years ago. Now we were both at university at the time uh, doing a Google Ambassador program. Now Josh has always been super passionate um, about sharing uh, his learnings and ideas and really passionate about tech. So He's now an IoT principal at Modus uh, and a falling technologist. I totally agree with that statement. Um, and he's got an awesome talk to give us on um, implementation, how to solution design and implement a new IoT project. So I'll let him discuss that because he knows best. Um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep, all good here. Yep, uh, and is my screen successfully shared? That too, yep, <laughs> perfect. Awesome. Cool. Um, so innovation is just creativity applied with technology. Sometimes it's hard for people outside of development to see how creative um, writing code or architecting a solution can be considered creative. But if you show a novel architecture or a bespoke algorithm to another developer, uh, guaranteed creative is among the words of praise that you'll hear. I find it really interesting when referring to the same algorithm or architecture, somebody from another field might refer to it as innovative, which led me to realize that innovation is just creativity uh, applied with technology. And innovation is really at the heart of IoT. Whether your motivations are business value driven, humanitarian ambitions, or to satisfy the deep and driving curiosity that many of us in the field have, we all push boundaries and innovate by collecting new intelligent insights from things previously considered mediocre. My friends and family um, from other fields have often said it's difficult to succinctly describe what it is I do for a living, and I have the same problem. So I guess I'll kick off with a little bit of background about me before going into the main core of the speech. Um, just to interrupt quickly, is it possible to make the uh, uh, preso a little bit bigger? Ah, oh, or... it's on my vertical screen, so... Um, oh, it's okay. okay, cool. No, it's all right. Hang on, I'll just swap screens <laughs> to make that easier. Also, love your chair. Just saying, was spotting it. <laughs> Thank you. All righty, uh, and I'll just share again. Also a big fan of the vertical screen because for coding, that actually makes sense. <laughs> 100%. Now let's pull this over here, so it's out of the way. How does that look aside from oh, that Amazing, thank you. That's much better, awesome. Cool, so g'day everybody. My name is Josh and I'm a bow tie enthusiast. Um, in case you wanna follow me on Twitter, which I don't use a lot or connect on LinkedIn, those are my ads. I'll bring them up again and I've added them to my profile within the platform. Um, so bow tie jokes aside, who's this bloke? Uh, my background is as a technical and occasional solutions architect. Um, I currently work in this space as a consulting principal at Modus and I collect hobbies like a 2002 primary schooler collected Pokemon cards. That is to say, indiscriminately. Some of my hobbies, in, uh, I'm an out, uh, enthusiast about outdoor survivalism. And when I get time, I like to do things such as cliff jumping, scuba diving, rock climbing, and camping. Uh, I'm an amateur blacksmith, attempting my first hand forged Damascus steel billet. And I enjoy cooking, and I'm looking at creating my own line of hot, si hot sauces, sp spiced salt seasonings, and jams. And I should probably cut back on the number of costumes I buy. Um, with some pretty decent ones for Geralt of Rivia, Obi-Wan Kenobi with a full combat grade um, RGB motion sensing lightsaber and a V for Vendetta among many others. i am recently, uh, recently been working on a chili farm where I'm growing over 40 varieties of chilies and over 400 individual plants. And of course, the part that you're all interested in, I'm a tinkerer, uh, inventor and nerd, whichever you prefer to call it, with a particular passion in the field of IoT. That's actually the desk behind me um, where I have a whole bunch of prototypes or projects that I've been working on or have benched because I'm too busy. Some of the ones you can see there are things such as a continuous ECG. I'm building a mobile phone connected halter device effectively. Um, RFID tracking for passive RFID tags, a LoRa enabled ultrasonic distance sensor, accelerometers for fall detection, fluorosolable microcontrollers with ultraviolet light sensors, 
uh, amongst many other things. A bit about my professional background. I started out in software development, doing a degree in software engineering, and I began to specialize in big data and IoT through a research um, thesis. After that, I started getting into a lot of hackathons. And even though you didn't ask for one, a fun fact is that I've participated in seven hackathons, five of which were competitive, and four or five I either um, won or received a commendation award. So I definitely did, uh, wrote down those hackathons that were through Telstra and the global IBM because bigger market. Um, from these hackathons I is where I started specializing in emerging tech and IoT. And I was the co-author, uh, one of the co-authors of the ACS 2018 paper, Australia's IoT Opportunity. So what do you actually do for work? Pretty much everyone. Um, I typically provide the short answer of I'm in emerging technologies and cloud consulting. But funnily enough, that doesn't actually mean much for people both in and out of our field because of how diverse those disciplines are. So how can I succinctly describe my role when it's led me to design and or develop technologies in healthcare, mining, government, utilities, um, energy, emergency services, and smart waste, to name a few. But in the end, I think that's what it comes down to. The nature of IoT is diversity. I was able to perform these roles because we're applying intelligent capabilities to the world of things at an increasing rate. We have intelligent vehicles, semi-autonomous decision engines. We even have smart toasters. And I think most of the people here wouldn't touch a smart toaster with a 10 foot pole unless they built it themselves for reasons I'm not going to rant about here, security and questionable necessity. Uh, but as developers, we have to be able to be flexible and we have to have biological plasticity. Something I've gotten reasonably good at is immersing myself in the field I'm being deployed into. When I start a new engagement in a new field, I'll hoard as much information as possible and I'll try to absorb it all. So today I'll be outlining a framework that you can use to solution design and implement a new IoT project. And I'll be using a real world example of an IoT project that I worked on. But this framework isn't exclusive to IoT. It can be abstracted and applied to any problem solving requirement. If at any point it seems like I'm just pointing out the obvious, it's because I likely am. Uh, when you abstract something out enough, you can conveniently apply general broad sweeping statements and the chances are they'll be true. So in order to make myself seem more knowledgeable on the topic, that's what I've done. So let's establish entry criteria for this theoretical engagement. You have a client or a customer or a product owner, you have someone representing stakeholders effectively, and they have an issue that they need solved. Uh, in this case, using IoT. They've engaged you to simply provide the solution, but we all know that it's not quite so simple. So as a general breakdown of the framework, there are four stages. Each of these phases have some form of import, a distillation process where you elicit the details required for that phase, and then some form of output. Pretty generic, right? So let's dive in with the first one, which is the problem domain. This involves you diving into the field um, of the problem to understand everything you can about the context of the problem, why it's a problem, and what uh, are the symptoms of the problem. Usually this requires you gathering all the information you can and learning as much as possible. This is can be a tough one because uh, sometimes stakeholders or clients may not see the value in you spending that time familiarizing yourself. You're not producing anything. But in the end, if there aren't any SMEs that you can utilize and you're going to be the one designing algorithms and a solution to solve a problem, you have to understand the problem and you have to understand the solution that you can use to solve it. In this example, the problem environment is that in extreme environments such as the northeast of West Australia, performing physically demanding tasks without being cognizant of your limitations in physical health can result in severe conditions such as dehydration, heat exhaustion, and even heat stroke, which can be fatal. So that's the problem, right? But what's the context of the problem? What are the symptoms, environmental factors? Why is it a problem? Some of the symptoms are like this. People literally work themselves to death. These articles talk about heat exhaustion, dehydration, and heat stroke causing injury or death. Why? Are the, are the workers being forced to? Is it negligence from the employer? There has been and very well still could be conditions where the employers are at fault, 
But in this case, because the employer is coming to us to design a solution to prevent this kind of event, we're going to progress with the assumption that they're not at fault. So what happened? Do they not realize they're endangering themselves? Are they so focused on the task at hand that they become out of sync with their body? This is very possible. Uh, I have an interesting condition that means when I'm focusing on a task, I actually forget to breathe. My brain is focusing so intently on processing thoughts uh, and then when it stops, uh, stops focusing, uh, I exhale and then inhale. It's something I've only recently discovered and I could have possibly had it for years or decades. After actually writing th that last sentence, I realized I was doing it and let out a big, big exhale. On the other side, is it monetary? These articles note that the fatalities are linked to contract work or uh, are they trying to maximize the number of work hours because they need the money or want more money? Do they not realize their limitations and they're just pushing themselves too hard? How can we protect people against something that they're not aware of or themselves? So any and all of these assumptions, firstly, need to be validated and verified with the client. They can clarify what you should focus on and whether any of your assumptions might be invalid. Uh, and they can even provide you with additional de details for your research. We then want to distill this information into a mission statement, which would be the output of this, uh, of this phase. And that will guide our research into the problem's possible solution. So distilling all this information that we have into the mission statement, we can um, arrive at, we need a solution that monitors a worker when they're beginning to show signs of physiological suffering, we can send them an alert and action a task. Now that we have the mission statement, we should run this by the client and validate again to make sure that we're working on what they want us to work on. In this case, we get the go ahead and we can proceed. So this mission statement is used to guide our solution elicitation. Before uh, we begin, I think it's really important to differentiate solution environment elicitation and solution or technical design. In this stage, elicitation, we are looking at the abstract solutions that can solve the problem. And you should be within the context of the problem in this phase. We aren't designing a technical solution yet. So what do we need to solution? For this, we refer back to the mission statement and we look at what components of, um, of it can, uh, can make up a solution. In this case, we need to identify the occurrence of stress. What does this look like and how can we detect it? Then we need to send an alert. Who do we send this to? How do we send it? When do we send it? And then what tasks need to occur at the receival of that? Using my example, we're now researching how can we tell when somebody is beginning to suffer physiologically? Now this part, much like the first, can quickly become a rabbit hole. So it's important to be broad on your analysis of the solution, but you also want to stay focused on contributing towards solving your mission statement and then refine it, uh, refine your search to be specific to the context of the problem. So broadly, what are some signs of physiolog uh, physiological suffering? We then focus on heat and stress and make it specific to workplace activities. So as, me uh, as mentioned earlier, we have dehydration, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, but I wonder if you can also tell uh, the body is suffering stress in other ways. Well, with heat illnesses, what are the dependencies or stages to them? I knew about heat exhaustion and heat stroke from my time as a first aid instructor and lifeguard. And in my research, I found many references that mentioned that heat exhaustion and heat stroke are actually part of a heat related illness spectrum from heat rash all the way through to heat stroke. Articles often reference that one of the essential strategies to minimize harm and a good method to mitigate uh, heat-related illness prevalence was hydration. So whilst heat exhaustion can occur independent of dehydration, in many cases, heat-exhausted people are dehydrated. Um, and in many cases, it's actually a transition from heat exhaustion to stroke. So a good first step here is identifying increased body temperature and dehydration, because if we can monitor body temp, um, as well as the hydration level, it might be possible to intercept heat exhaustion as it develops or before it develops. Body temp is pretty straightforward. Uh, however, there is a difference between core body temperature and surface temperature, I found out. So when we get to the technical design, we'll have to look for technical capabilities um, between the two. 
Now, dehydration, I would find out, is actually much more complicated. And for any students of the medical world watching, the nature of IoT is very exploratory. So some of the things I say here might be controversial or they might be less than 100% proven. Uh, I'm also, for the sake of time, grossly oversimplifying my description of research. Um, so bear that in mind. Looking into research, I would find out that dehydration is typically determined through some decently invasive or cumbersome tests, such as uh, a blood cell uh, indices, urinary tests, or body weight change. Not really things that you can pick up using IoT in the field. But there has been a lot of work in less invasive means, um, and one such that's come up quite a lot and provided a good amount of published papers on the topic is using galvanic skin response or electrodermal activity. Uh, GSR, GSR is the electrical characteristics of the skin and using a test such as bioimpedance, which people familiar um, with body scans at gyms might know, it measures the impedance of an electrical current through the body. You can determine hydration levels. GSR can also be used to determine physiological stress or how physically stressed your body is. This is thanks to skin conductivities, uh, responsiveness to stimuli such as stress. And being able to determine stress and dehydration would be a fantastic way to protect the workers. So we know from our mission statement that we want to send and raise an alert. Um, but who do we want to alert? How will we alert them? What is the alert? And when do we want to send it? These are the questions that we need to ask and we need to answer. So for the who, we discussed the possibility that the person uh, may not be aware of the strain they're putting on themselves earlier. So alerting them would be valuable. Um, but what if they were aware and willing to work anyway? How do we protect them from themselves? For this, we came up with the idea of either um, alerting their supervisor or their work partner. This does raise a number of ethical questions, um, such as the potential impact of our solution on the user. But upon discussing it with the client, we deemed um, that out of scope. For the purposes of our solution, uh, our job is to keep the person safe and the organization will work on the logistics of ensuring the workers are not negatively impacted by our technology. So with all this in mind, we went um, for an early indicator to the person themselves. And then if conditions did not improve, they would receive another alert uh, as long, uh, alongside uh, an alert to their direct supervisor. So what's the best way to receive this alert? Text, email, smoke signals, Ideally, we want something that can get their attention even if they're focused. And furthermore, the reliability of sending a message to a phone isn't really good enough. They might not have, them on, uh, have it on them during the shift. They might not want to install an application for work on their personal phone. They might just ignore it. So uh, and we also found out from the client that all the workers do have a tablet they use for their tasks on shift. Uh, and of course, they'll have the sensing device as well. So for this stage, we determined that alerting through the wearable uh, and through the tablet will be the way to go. So what tasks do we want to action? Um, ideally, the first message should be informative. You are now at risk. We want them to acknowledge that they've received the message so we know that you know, they've uh, received the warning. And uh, the message will advise them to go to a cool area, rest and rehydrate. By the time it gets to the second, they're at an increased risk of a serious illness and we need to take steps to protect them. So they'll be instructed to rest, um, go to a cool area, consume water over a 30 minute period um, and their supervisor will also be notified. Uh, I know how this sounds. You're sitting there like, Josh, you can't dub in the blokes. They're just trying to make a living or snitches get stitches, mate. But we aren't being malicious dictators uh, that want to interrupt and annoy people on their job. And this isn't us getting in the way of somebody doing their regular duty. By the time these alerts go off, the person is at significant risk of a serious uh, illness. So with all that in mind, now we want to produce a set of solution theories that will be the output of this section. What we have is we will use heart rate and body temperature to detect stress. We use GSR to determine hydration and stress. And we will send the first alert to the person over watch and iPad, um, wearable and tablet, and we will send the second alert to the person and their supervisor over the same means. The first message advises the worker to rest in a cool shaded area and drink water. The second message instructs the worker 
to rest in a cool shaded area and drink water. So now that we have the solution theories relating to the three stages of the solution, we want to validate them with the client. In this case, they were happy and they recommended some slight adjustments, but we were able to proceed. So we now have formed an image of the solution that we're going to be building um, to, our, to solve our client's problem. And here's the fun part, looking at the technology to implement that solution and design what our technical solution will look like. So we have the solution theories and we now need to look at the tech and whether or not we can build them out because at this point, uh, the solutions might not be technically feasible with the technology that we currently have at our disposal. So one of the first things we'll be looking at is any restrictions. The second is the available technology that we can use to, uh, to design the solution. And then finally designing the technical solution itself. I won't be going into uh, any details or depth about the development itself. Uh, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the relationship between the solution and the tech. For good pr uh, coding practices, design practices, software architecture, uh, you should go and read Uncle Bob's books rather than watching this presentation. So we know we want to collect heart rate, body temp, and GSM. Uh, for this, we would need some biometric sensors. So the first thing we should ask ourselves is what restrictions are in place? And of the restrictions, um, the first thing you should consider is, does the client have something in mind or something in the field already? Uh, and then you have your additional considerations such as, uh, are there any water or dust resistance, budgetary, battery life, peripheral requirements, things like that. <clears throat> in our case, the client was happy for us to make suggestions as to the biometric wearables but the system had to integrate with their iOS tablets in the field, as well as um, they had to be commercially available. So we couldn't hack together you know, our own perfect system uh, and then and manufacture that. So those were our restrictions, but we still had the design considerations to have below that. So starting broad, we, looked, uh, we were looking for commercial wearables that can work with iOS. We wanted to focus on ones with biometrics um, and this gave us a list of the Apple Watch at the time, the Fitbit Ionic, the Polar Smart, the Garmin Phoenix 5, and the Samsung Gear 3, uh, yeah, Gear 3, S3, as well as a special, uh, specialized medical grade wearable we were trialing as well. From this, we wanted to refine it to ones taking into consideration water and dust resistance, battery life, product costs, peripheral requirements, and development costs. Um, as procurement costs for all these devices were similar, the product cost was less a factor. We ended up ruling out Polar Smart, Phoenix 5, and the Samsung Gear due to availability, development costs, and lacking specific sensors we needed without peripherals. Uh, and we also ruled out the medical grade wearable uh, due to battery life and IP rating. It wasn't; uh, it just wasn't made for the conditions that you would see in the weather and dust and battery life that you would require on prolonged periods of shifts. So that left us with the Apple Watch and the Fitbit Ionic. With an understanding of what wearables we can use, uh, now we can look at the solutions we elicited uh, from the solution environment and we need to get a technical design. So firstly, this uh, requires us coming up with algorithms for the solutions that we identified, followed by our general cloud and system architecture. Um, for this, let's look at designing an algorithm first for normal heart rates. So generally heart rates sit between standard ranges, but they actually also differ based on fitness, age, weight, gender, and physical state. Uh, so at rest, normal, active, all of these factors need to be considered. So instead of designing a very specific heart rate zone, we wanted to make one based on a sliding scale that normalizes to each person. Um, it establishes a baseline for the person and then uses a scaling modifier uh, to adjust the general zones for each state. That way you're not getting false positives when suddenly the work becomes physical, it just transitions them into a new state, identifying that they're in a, uh, in a significantly different period. Uh, so that gives us the, the algorithm to apply for heart, heart rate zones. The surface body temperature itself is pretty straightforward, um, but because some people run a little bit hotter or colder than others, we may as well apply the same logic as the heart rate, establish a modifier per person, apply that to the general thresholds, 
Um, although as temperatures are much lower than heart rates, the variance from the standard was considerably smaller. Um, and then we'll also look at the heart rate when the temperature is spiking as combining both metrics was shown in research to be more reliable than just temperature. So now we need one for dehydration and one for stress. Unfortunately, we couldn't get galvanic skin response from the Fitbit or Apple, uh, which means hydration itself is out. However, we found an equation um, where we can use the heart rate and body temperature to calculate what's called a physiological strain index or PSI, different PSI for any scuba divers in the crowd. Um, and that can be used to identify people at risk of heat exhaustion or strain. So we, uh, with that variance in what we had discussed with the clients previously, we looped back uh, with the client to make sure they were happy with what we were doing. In our case, they were happy that uh, we had the three measurements and that would sufficiently indicate the well-being of their employees. And the reality is that finding an alternative or having to bespoke make the hardware would draw out uh, for too long. And it wasn't what the client wanted in this phase of their project. So now that we have the, the technical designs for the algorithms um, and how to detect when somebody's beginning to be stressed, we need to look at the technology design for how we'll be alerting them. We know from the solution environment section that we did earlier uh, that they will have iPads and of course, they will have the wearables, um, both of which have vibration motors and can support mobile notifications when linked with the phone. So as part of each stage, we'll include uh, in our technical design for wearables, the alerts and the iPad alerts. Uh, the first stage being to the end user and then the second to the end user and their supervisor. Uh, and finally, the final part, finally the final part uh, of the solution design was action, the actioning component. So the users received their initial alert and acknowledged it, but we had to consider what if they didn't acknowledge it. Um, so we decided in that case, we would resend the alert every 15 seconds for one minute. And if there was still no acknowledgement, then we would escalate that as not responding uh, to their supervisor. If they do acknowledge it, however, then the device would just continue to monitor them. Um, and if their state hadn't improved for the next 30 minutes, the second alert is then sent. We explored the possibility of utilizing um, the device's inbuilt GPSs to see whether they'd moved to a shaded area that could be identified. But the client ruled this out uh, and said it was a little bit creepy. So we left that out. Um, as we'd been doing a kind of micro validations this whole time with the client, we didn't have anything big or that they weren't aware of for this stage of validation. Um, but usually this is where you validate all your technical designs with your, just, uh, with your assumptions as well, but they were happy. So we got the go ahead to move forward into implementation. So now we get into the solution implementation itself and the continuous validation. And this is something really important to note. Up until now, the primary validator is your client, um, customer, product owner, the, the representative of the stakeholders, the person engaging you to, uh, to develop this solution. Now this changes to the end user. You're no longer designing the solution. And by the time you get here, the stakeholders should be happy with everything you've designed. Uh, otherwise you would have reviewed it until they were. Now you need the support of the end users because if they don't like your solution, they won't use it. The majority of the time, your client will fully understand this, but sometimes you will work with difficult people who don't understand the feedback from end users uh, relating usability it is more important than the feedback from the product owner, when, uh, you know, relating specifically to usability. It may be a controversial opinion, but my thoughts are the stakeholders have signed off on everything that you've done to date. And as long as you follow that plan, the client should be happy. Um, and they usually are. That's not to say the client gets no say, but um, uh, because product owners are an important part of the development life cycle, um, but remember who will be using your solution. So at this point, I'm not gonna go into the different product development life cycles. I'm not gonna open that can at all. Uh, all I would say is make sure every few weeks you're validating the solution with your end users. So essentially do user acceptance testing. There, uh, there's nothing worse than working on a project, coming up with something awesome only to have nobody use it because the vision uh, fits with the stakeholders and not the end users. So that's it. Um, I know the framework is very top heavy, um, but I'm not here to tell you what's good development practice. Uh, that is far too broad. Um, 
So yeah, if you found these slides pretty, um, they're much nicer than I usually develop. It's because I use this template from Slide Carnival. I'm required by law to have this in. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for taking the time to dial in and watch my speech. Special thanks to Ali for inviting me to speak and feel free to reach out via LinkedIn. I will be hanging around for the networking. Amazing. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, that was awesome. I love how holistic this product is and it's, it really speaks to me because it's exactly what tech is for, helping us uh, do cool things um, or helping us in some way. love the quote at the beginning as well. It always reminds me of creativity is intelligence having fun and that's exactly kind of, and that's in tech as well. So I loved that you'd uh, get it towards tech. We do have a few questions, some of them about the IoT and some of them just about Chile. So <laughs> uh, we'll start with the IoT ones. What sort of device testing do you do to test devices that need to operate in extreme heat like a desert? Cool. Good question. Um, for this, this depends entirely on the client. Um, I haven't done any, uh, I've been fairly fortunate in that I haven't had to test anything myself. Um, either they're looking for a commercial product, um, in which case the client will specify, um, you know, the, the base requirements of the, the hardware. They'll say it has to have been rated or um, has to be able to function in, in this kind of environment. Uh, one of the projects I did work on uh, partnered with a university. Um, they're, they're being fitted to very, very big vehicles. Uh, and those very big vehicles have a lot of vibrations. So all of the hardware that went on had to be um, stress tested for vibrations. So, um, but I'm fortunate I, I never had to, you know, fly out and hang around in the 43 degree heat um, to test anything like that. But yeah, usually the client will specify either like standardized requirements or um, there'll be a, a hardware partner that's providing the actual um, solution that, that they will um, test everything up to scratch. Makes sense. Um, awesome. Thank you. Um, what's our next question? Peter From Peter, do you see value in soliciting end user feedback earlier? Yeah, 100%. In the so cycle? if um, I, obviously being in, de uh, in development, I usually follow um, Agile and Scrum. As part of that, from first release, we're doing UAT uh, and usability testing. Um, that's, that's my background. I've worked heavily in, uh, in scrum teams with UAT as part of sprints. Um, but I, I realized the reality is in some, uh, life, uh, some development life cycles, you're not going to have the opportunity to use that. Um, you know, it might, uh, they might be using waterfall for whatever reason, but I, yeah, hundred percent that in the end, if somebody, you should be getting the opinions of the person who's going to be using it because if they don't like it, they're not going to use it. Totally. It's all about user-focused design and they're the ones that know best about Definitely. what their situation is too most of the time. So, yeah, definitely. So one from Animesh Doobie here. How did you address the inherent cybersecurity requirements of production-focused resource companies? Did you face any restrictions with respect to network and Yeah, absolutely. Protocol? The interesting thing is um, the, the security requirements vary greatly between projects and clients. Uh, it's usually more down to the specific requirements of the company that you're working with than um, kind of overarching government, that kind of thing. Um, so I've worked in some where it's, it's been, you know, ridiculously locked down to the point where you can't be productive um, because you have to work in a specific location or you have three jump boxes or something like that. Um, generally, uh, we, we always try to apply best practices um, we'll always say, you know, as a default encryption at rest and, uh, at rest and in transit. Um, sometimes those requirements are significantly higher, um, but generally, sorry, I think I deviated from the original question. <laughs> All good. Yeah. I think uh, the general were there though. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Um, last question on the on the actual uh, product. Um, is this specific to stress at work? How will it determine if it's exercise that's increasing the heart rate and dehydration level? Yeah, so this was specific to um, the workers were on shift uh, in their day-to-day -day role. Um, they would take the wearables when they began their shift and they would um, take them off at the end of their shift. So um, it, it wasn't factoring in that they would go to the gym or something like that. Yeah, awesome. And, like, again, I really loved this because there's so many applications for it, I think, as well. Like, um, 
definitely IoT and healthcare. It's a, it's a massive field. AI and healthcare as well, another massive field. And we had a meetup about it not long ago. So yeah, there's so much happening in that area, and super excited about um, where that kind of takes us. Because you, you know, I, I'd love to have non-invasive mm. surgeries. There's just really the sky's the limit. Awesome. Um, so now I'd love you to take a breath. Uh, firstly, um, <laughs> bit disappointed you didn't wear a bow tie as well, yeah. Josh. Um, and we've got a couple of questions on the chilies before we wrap up, Michelle. So, what's do you water your chili manually or have something uh, I automated? I still water them manually. I, mean, uh, I I have done my uh, research into hydroponics <laughs> and aquaponics. Um, obviously, the end state. So I'm in the design phase at the moment. End state will be a fully automated aquaponic system. Because obviously balancing the wow. water chemical balance um, and feeding the fish are the only two kind of require external influencing requirements of an aquaponic system. So uh, you know, auto deployable lime to balance the nitrate, nitrate, nitrite, nitrate, and ammonia levels of the water, as well as feeding the fish. Um, uh, we're, we're yeah, gonna have to so I didn't to ask that question, that. but I upvoted it because. Like I spend half an hour every day watering my garden, so I was hoping you were going to give me an easy way. <laughs> take, take some time, doesn't it? <laughs> there are a few options, though. And last question, what's the highest Scoville unit chili uh, you have ever I'm, grown? I'm growing up to re the Reapers, so the current Guinness World Record holder officially. Um, I have some hot sauces, which is uh, include Pepper X, um, which is kind of the alleged, uh, but they is proprietary to the Hot One show, so they haven't had it officially tested. But yeah, I've got I've got about I think twenty or thirty Reaper uh, Reaper plants. Awesome, and that's that's it. Thank you again, Josh. Um, and yeah, hang around, have a chat to Josh after this. I'll leave you with uh, Michelle, who's going to end this. Thanks, for yeah, us. thank you very much. Thank you again, Josh and Rajiv. Um, and keep your questions going in the chat if you guys have anything more to say to them. Um, or you can reach out to developer Ali or myself or developer Steve indeed if you have any questions for us or the speakers after. Um, I think we've recorded these. I think I'll get a confirmation from developer Ali, but I think we'll be posting these up on YouTube anyway. Um, and our previous talks um, from the Oz IoT and Melbourne IoT meetup are on the YouTube page as well. So someone could post that in the chat. That would be awesome so everyone can see. Um, just the last part of today is ask if anyone wants to go off mute and uh, share a project that they've been working on. Um, it could be, you know, maybe you can answer my question to how you don't you know, water your garden for half an hour every day. Um, if anyone was on hydroponics before, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, put your hand up if you want to share a project. Um, what do you mean put your hand up? Do they have hands up in remote? Is that a thing? No, I don't think so. Maybe just go off mute. <laughs> um, but if not, uh, if there's no one here to, to share a quick present, it's a thing. Apparently it's a thing. Oh, maybe because I'm presenting, I can't put my hand up. But if you are in the chat, you can put your hand up. Let's see. I think someone put their hand up. Anyway, I don't know how to use this thing, so I'm going to have to leave the, the, the IBM crew <laughs> to bring anyone up. Yeah, there, there's no hands up, but I think we can talk about that in the networking as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I was just, uh, okay, so Fashad just said, yep. Does that mean you want to talk? Oh, I think he was just agreeing that it does exist, the hands up thing, so. <laughs> okay, so, uh, no, he doesn't want to come up. That's fair enough. Um, so the other thing I was just going to say is we're going to um, put the tables back on then. Um, and then so you're able to continue networking. Sorry about my fidget spinner, guys. I just realised that that came in the camera, but this is for me to stop banging on the table. Um, yeah, so we might just uh, close the presentation session and head back into the tables for the next 15 or so minutes. Um, it was really cool to have you guys in today. I really love the Q&As that were coming through. Um, it's always great when you're doing a virtual presentation to have Q&As coming, and I love the upvoting thing too. So. Um, like we said, we're probably going to start this back up again in February. Um, you know, we might, might even get Rajiv back at some point to finish the other half of your talk. That'd be awesome. Yep. Um, and anyone else who would like to speak or would like to recommend a speaker for the OS IoT Meetup, please let us know. Um, yeah, that's that's all I had to say. What about you guys? Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, Steve. Oh, I just wanted to say a quick thank you because, like, this was the, the first year that this whole thing started. So I don't. I literally just realized that. So um, oh. like on behalf of all of us, just thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for making it awesome and just geeking out and talking IoT stuff. So yeah, that was all I wanted to say. Awesome. Yeah. How, like imagine when you guys started, like was it in, in February or something? 
um, you had your Melbourne yes. meetups. Could you have imagined that by December we would have well, done like six months online? <laughs> but, well, I mean, we only had one IRL event, one in real life uh, event, and then everything kind of, well, everything went agile. <laughs> and, agile. Um, agile, totally <laughs> agile. And then like it, there was maybe a month or two where we were figuring out uh, just everything. And then, yeah, we started the online thing. So, yeah, yeah just yeah. Thank you for every, to everyone for coming and making it awesome. Thank you. Yep, definitely. I totally agree. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. And we'll see you in February. Yeah, you on the table. Talk to you now. See ya.